Hey guys, good morning from my side as well. Thanks for the warm words, actually. Um, to be very honest, it doesn't feel too good standing in front of, of a crowd of great, ambitious entrepreneurs and get introduced as investor. The only reason I'm an investor these days is that I just turned 50 and um, was just starting a company was just too much work for me. So I decided to become an investor since it's, it's actually way less obtrusive and it's way less challenging compared to the challenges you guys are facing. I, quick one, how many of you are actually either starting a company or are thinking of starting a company? So this talk is for you guys. All others, maybe with the exception of Mike, should think whether or not they should start a company. Because in my experience, it's actually the, by way the best path to your life you can possibly have. Nothing beats entrepreneurship. When I started my, my entrepreneurial career, I was 14, 14 years, and actually I started without knowing that this is the start of an entrepreneurial career. Um, we just thought, you know, entrepreneurship is always about problem solving. And if you're 14 or 15, you have a big problem. You want to get as meet as many girls as possibly. Yeah, that's, I mean, that's in a, in a way, that's why music is so important in this year, because it's music and love is strongly correlated. So we decided together with two friends to start a DJing company uh, with the main aim actually of having fun. So we um, started organizing parties, organizing um, a club. And literally I did this for 15 years, all my uh, end of school years and university. Being a German, I had the great pleasure of spending eight years in university. So I studied, uh, it's awesome. It's also, I, I know it sends the wrong message here, I know that, but uh, <laughs> this is a very personal note. Um, so I could literally spend my whole twins in the, in the wonderful environment of, of the university. No economic pressure whatsoever. Um, I've written my PhD at that time about futures and options, so derivatives, in the core of the banking world. And when I said to my professor, after having finished my PhD, well, no, I just don't want to work in banking, I start my own company in the media space with two friends, he said, you're such an idiot. And from a rational ROI point of view, he's probably right, but from a life and experience point of view, he is almost certainly wrong. Because starting a company, taking the risk, is as beautiful really as exciting as it gets. When we started, we had no clue whatsoever what we are doing. I mean, the only reason we, we started a company, we, the rationale behind has been, we are three guys, we know each other very well, we are quite complementary in our skills and weaknesses, we have fun together, and somehow we figure it out. And that's what we tried from 94, one to 97, literally, we tried pretty much everything you can. This was, in a way, in Germany at least, pre-internet. We tried pretty much everything. No, just use your phone, it's fine. Um, we started pretty much everything, advertising, promoting. In 93, for example, I was running around as the, as the Punica Oase in, in, uh, in the new German territories promoting Procter & Gamble's famous orange juice uh, to the new Eastern German consumers. And um, since the promoter became ill, uh, I needed to go there. So I spent a whole weekend in front of a parking ground, in front of a supermarket in Mecklenburg-Vorpommern, um, which was a rather interesting experience. But it shows that you need, to be, you need to be willing to do whatever is needed. And this is not changing the whole life, whether you start a company, whether you're lucky enough to get in the hyper-growth phase, um, or whether you, on Steve Jobs' level, continue to, to innovate on a global scale. 
luckily, luckily we had a we had one good idea. Finally, 97, we thought it might be somehow actually before. In 97, we had a company of 40 people, all mostly from, from service industry. We lost two, our two biggest clients, and we needed to downsize to 20 people, and we actually thought, well, maybe it wasn't the best of ideas to do this whole self-employment, so we've been in a, in a, in a big, big crisis. But having been forced again to be, to be creative, so we came up with the idea of doing online auctions in the, in the internet, very enthusiastic. We attended a startup pitch from Bertelsmann, organized. 25 teams made it. We presented and we came in, not in the top five, not in the top 10, not even in the top 20. We came in last. Last. And at that time, it was pointed online auctions number 25. I actually would love to explore this moment. Why, why the hell didn't we stop? And frankly, I don't know. Something, something inside us, we've been, we've been convinced we are right. I, I, I can't tell you more. It was a lot of, of gut feeling. There is a lot, there is, this is disruptive, this is working. And literally 15 months later, we've been on the Frankfurt Neuer Markt, uh, worth 350 million euro, and had the first, or my personal first experience of, of hyper growth, which is just beautiful, you know? You sit in the company, and it's just, you feel the users want your service, everything is coming to you, people want to work for you. All this excitement at that time, we grew at around 1.5% a day, continuously for, for, for 12 to 18 months. And it's just, nothing can beat this feeling. And even if it takes a couple of years, like in, in, in my example, it took seven years. And trust me, our peers, so all my friends, they already had a BMW and they worked for McKinsey and for all these nice, they had nice apartments and we, yes, we've been able to pay us a kind of okayish salary, but that was pretty much it and we worked probably harder than, uh, well, not the McKinsey guys, but all the others. Um, yeah, I mean, how can you, how can you potentially, if you are gifted from, from the nature by great intelligence, probably great skills, a great working ethics. How can you end up working for McKinsey? Or Goldman? I mean, how can you do this? It is just, do you really want to want to only consult? Or do you re really, if you enter the banking world, do you really want to make nothing out of, out of nothing, more nothing? In, in a way, money is nothing, yeah? We just agreed that the dollar is, has some exchange value, or euro, or whatever. But inherently, it's nothing. It's just a service. And why do you want to spend time in optimizing nothing? No, I think, I think you deserve better. Um, so this may be a bit to my, to my background. And now more to the to the keynote, to the entrepreneurs. I, since my memory is not the best, I took the liberty of asking 10 entrepreneurs. I, I, I run in, in, in London these days an incubator and a small uh, venture fund focused on very early stage, 60 million US dollars, called Passion Capital. Um, and we have a co-working space. Right now we have, we did, I think since April, we did 18 investments and want to continue at that, at that pace. And I took the liberty of asking 12 of the teams, what is the most important skills for starting a company? Out of these 12 people, 
Unfortunately, I've asked for five criteria. Out of these 12 guys, only one said, well, you need great investors. Only one. Oh, a bit disappointing. But they're right. It's not about the investors. It's not about the gray hair guys. It's not about the 40, 50 year old guys who have been successful previously, who have achieved a great career, or whatever member of the board at some media company. It, it doesn't count. What's counting is the entrepreneur. That's the only thing that counts. So it, it is not choosing the right investors very much. I'm not sure whether I should have told you that, but OK, that's what it is. The only three criteria that came up frequently, actually 10 times, 7 times, and 7 times, is speed, sweat, and team. Speed, not blood, sweat, and tears, but speed, sweat, and team. Start, let's start with the team. So the way we invest is we literally only focus on the team. I mean, how else can you decide? Imagine there's a guy coming to you in 2008 or seven, showing you a picture here with headphones and hardwired microphones to it. Headphone, hardwired microphones. And then stating below, this is my prototype from the year 2000. And I want to create a new music format. The guy's over there, it's Michael, former founder of, of Last.fm. Actually, he's the Pete Best of Last.fm since... Oh, come on, guys, are you so... You don't know who Pete Best is, yeah? Does anyone know who Pete Best is? Oh, my God. Oh, my God, he was the fifth Beatle. He left. He left, actually, in 62. And this was probably a bad, a bad decision. So Michael left Last FM. I actually, that's how we, that's how we met. And he had this, this unbelievable idea of creating RJ DJ, reality jockey, and creating a new music format. He had this idea already in 2000, but with the iPhone, he saw that the hardware has actually made its way. And that was already enough. I mean, what, what, what shall you as an investor, where shall you look at? Does it make sense to analyze the market? No, because there is no market. Is there anyone out there doing a similar thing? No. So it's only down to the people. So to the team, most important with the team is that you, I'm a big fan of, 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 of co-founding teams, but I'm backing single guys as well. Um, I think it's most important that you, that you form up, that you team up with the right co-founders. But team is actually way more. It's about the first five hires are setting the tone for your company. Um, my, my these days partner in, in passion, Eileen Burbridge, used to be employee number three at Skype and was heading the product. And she, even today, gets this glimpse in her eyes when she's talking about this experience. Because being among the first five or ten employees in the company just I mean, it just sets the mark, you know, you set the, the voice, the culture of, 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 of a company. And for you as founders, it's actually the most critical thing you need to do is selecting the right first five guys, because they set the tone. If you hire mediocre people, even though there's a lot of shit to be done, and you, you literally don't know jiggling so many balls in the air, you literally don't know what, what to do, where to focus, Nevertheless, it's better to let a mediocre person go out of the team and replace it. In the team, 
next one in the team, you need to be willing to, to be lucky. You know, surprisingly, out of this list, out of these 12 guys, only one said luck is an important factor. If you ask investors or more seasoned people, I'd say probably eight out of 10 tell you it's luck. Luck is important. You can't force luck, but you can expose yourself to luck. And that's what you as the founding team need to do constantly. You need to expose yourself to luck. Think of, think of a great footballer, you know, a forward. He's literally running 100 times his teammates are shooting to the goal, 100 times. And he's running 100 times towards the goalie, waiting for the bounce. He doesn't know it, but he's actually exposing himself to the luck. And then he's using a thing that's actually the reason why I hate business plans. I think business plans are totally overrated, and business plans are a subgenre of science fiction, nothing else. Maybe I've written too many myself. But it's way more important to trust your instincts, to believe, to believe your gut feeling. Because as an entrepreneur in a team, you're constantly, I mean, you're constantly jiggling with balls in the air, and you always have more stuff to do than you can possibly manage. So where to prioritize, where to focus on, how to set the right decisions. It is all I have learned now. Luckily, I've learned it quite early. That's probably my, my, my biggest learning experience, that I am able to trust my gut feeling and my gut instinct. And maybe that's a function that I, I've written four years a PhD about the predictability of uh, foreign exchange rates. And actually, realize after four years, there is no way that you can look into the future, even on such a dumb thing like foreign exchange rates, where you have interest rates and all this, all this kind of rational hard facts. You have all the charts, you have all the basic, all the material you can possibly have, but in reality, it doesn't help you. My professor at university always said to me, by talking about looking into the future, predicting uh, whatsoever will happen in the future. If you are so smart, why aren't you rich? And he's right. So the best thing to do is actually trust your gut instinct and work on a way that you and your team find the way of because maybe one of maybe the gut instincts are totally different, which is very likely. Uh, find a way of communicating among the gut instinct. Of course, in, in teams, it's actually quite good if you have the ability to execute, so if you know your stuff as well. Next thing is speed. Speed. You know, when we, when we launched Ricardo, I was I mean, just imagine, we launched this company, I told you the story, seven years of really wrestling and working hard and so on. Then we have hit this one, and half a year later, so we launched on 21st July 98. In January, we had a company of 12 people and I'd say eight interns, and we had the beauty parade. So we invited banks for preparing or pitching for, for an IPO. Glory days, actually. It was fantastic. Um, so imagine nine guys from the big banks, all with suits and so on, come into your office. I gave a glorious speech about, you see, all whites, all, wa all walls, it's all white, but it's written on there. It's speed, it's white on white, it's written here, it's written there. And that is true, and it remains true. As long as you decide fast, it's good. As long as you decide. Every, maybe from time to time, it's good to have a sleepover, a decision, but then you need to decide, and you, you, you need to be willing to decide. You always, you as well, need a kind of flexibility, 
I, I'll never forget that moment when, at that time, it was, I think, West LB uh, gave their, during this IPO beauty parrot, gave their glorious speech, and then I have calculated on a discounted cash flow method. I was, I was looking, I thought, I, I, I've never heard of discounted cash flow before. And he said, well, after having five years in the future, your company is worth 950 million. I mean, as an entrepreneur, what's your reaction? You know, you started a company literally five months before. You know, there are 12 employees and another eight interns. And then someone is telling you you're, you're, you're worth close to a billion. What's your reaction? It's terrible. So you need to deal with all the all possible kind of circumstances you cannot imagine, imagine beforehand. With the speed, it is well important that you learn to, to know when to say no. It's actually probably to the same extent important to say no um, than to say yes. Saying no is a great ability you need to have. Sweat. I don't know whether this needs a lot of explanation. Um, it's just that the competition is brutal out there. Yeah? I've, um, and competition is brutal, actually. It has been brutal from mainly dictated by, by the valley. I predict for the next 10 years that the competition will actually even increase and the new tone will be set by the Asian guys. Um, I'm a co-founder of Rebate Networks. It's actually my first copycat ever, and I thought I never do a copycat. Actually, I do enjoy it a lot. It's, it's the daily deal business which we do in Central Eastern Europe, Germany, and mainly in, in Asia, from Indonesia to, to China. So I got a bit of an insight in, in Asia, and trust me, what's happening in Beijing, what's happening in, in, in other cities, this brings the competition to another level, and your, your sweat to another level. These guys work like there's no tomorrow, literally. It's, they, they close to work 18-7, so not 24-7, but 18-7 is probably their average and as determined as it gets, and um, we only, there's only one, one way to reply is accepting these standards and, and go for it. This is very much correlated to, to the speed issue. Um, you just get more shit done uh, when you work harder and use it. Be, be persistent, be determination, um, is what, what's needed. So it's speed, sweat, and team. What I would like to add is to this three from, from our founders is the point I made with the, with the gut feeling, with the instinct. Just do it. Steve Jobs has never, ever worked with a research company. And that's the reason why he's so successful. Because if you're asking people, you know, the, 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 the RJDJ uh, example, if you ask people, are you interested in augmented music, you only, the only reply you're getting is question marks. And probably the same would have been true for most of the innovations of, of Steve Jobs. If you really want to disrupt the world, trust your gut. It's actually good to have a problem you're solving. Yeah? It helps. Mark Zuckerberg, for example, in my understanding, had the problem that he was only an average-looking dude. And he was interested, he saw all the, all the beautiful chicks on, uh, on the campus, and he was looking for a way to get known to them. It's, it's, a, it's not a very technical problem he's solving. <laughs> but he solved the problem. Uh, and that is very true for literally most of the real successful companies. And again, with the, with the, with the business plan, plan, if you would have written a business plan in 2002, 
about your beautiful idea of making phone calls free. It would have, would have been a pretty boring business plan, yeah? I mean, you just enter with the amount always a zero, so we all know the result. Now, nine years later, the company is making a billion dollars in revenue and got sold to Microsoft for 8.5 billion. So it's way more about the problem because it was badly needed from all of us. We wanted to chat to our, and speak to our friends in Indonesia and not talking, not paying all these all this stupid fees. So this, this whole problem solving is only starting. You know? We are 15 years in this revolution here, but, but it's, it's very comparable to what has happened with the, with the, with the trains and the individual mobility uh, 100, 120 years ago. Um, and it's going to, to increase big time. I attended the talk of, of Eric Schmidt from, from Google, and he said uh, literally in 2002 they collected, I forgot the number, was two terabytes in the year. That was in 2002. He said in 2011 they are collecting these, the same amount of data every four days, and they think they will collect in 2014 two terabytes every 14 minutes. So the pace isn't changing. It's not changing at all. So make the best. Just make the best out of it. And the last one, I'd say this is... I mean, there's a reason why, why I named or we named our company Passion Capital. So it's pretty obvious that we, we are into passion. It's especially helpful if you are passionate about what you do or enthusiastic what you're doing when it gets tough, and it always gets tough. I've never heard a single entrepreneur who didn't have tough moments in his, uh, in his whole starting process. It helps big time not to lose your vision, your long-time goal, and stay committed and be able to deliver the energy you need to, you need to deliver. It's different probably with a, with a different risk set if you are more a copycat person, um, then you probably don't need to be that passionate. Um, it, it, it's maybe similar to what happens in the music industry. You know, I, I, I'd call all these copycat guys, I, I'd say they are the, the, the casting show equivalent. You know, you can make a great business return out of producing whatever star in whatever casting show, reality show. But it's going to be bloody difficult to find an Amy Winehouse that way. And I think we all should be as ambitious as it gets, and we should actually aim for becoming the, the Amy Winehouse or becoming the real innovator out of Europe, because I frankly... I don't think that we have a structural deficit here in Europe. I actually think it's the opposite. On a, on a global understanding, we are, we are better prepared, or we should be in a better position to create global leading services. You know, we have, we have probably the best designers globally, mainly, I know it's cliche, but I mean, these Italian or French guys talking about partly the Brits as well, talking about design is just outstanding. We have an unbelievable power of execution, mainly from, from Germans, Austrians, Dutch people. We are fantastic when it comes to execution. We have tech talent and determination as hell very comparable, uh, in a way, culturally to, to the Chinese situation in, in Eastern Europe. And we have cool dudes, mainly Scandinavian guys, who are able to run companies. I mean, there's a reason why so many big European successes are started by Scandinavian people. It's Skype, it's Spotify, 
look what we do with Flatter and, and, and Peter Zunde, the, the, the former founder of Pirate Bay. Pirate Bay is actually Europe's biggest success in digital. It's the only top 100 company, according to Alexa, on a global scale, is Pirate Bay. And you know what? We should make use of it. We should actually leverage these kind of success. Thanks a lot. And fingers crossed, even though it's not that important to win this competition today, I told you in the early days, but nevertheless, fingers crossed and enjoy and just build kick-ass companies. Thank you, guys. Thanks very much, Stefan.